Um, so the final uh, English language uh, workshop um, comes from colleagues uh, in Belgium. Uh, so big thank you to Christophe and Laurent for uh, making an early start to their day today to join us here at BioC Asia. And they're going to be presenting a workshop on single cell proteomics uh, and bioconductor packages that support that. Uh, as someone who doesn't do proteomics but does single cell work, um, I actually find it quite amazing that there are single cell proteomics uh, assays out there and um, really interested to see uh, what, what's out there and, and how we can analyze that in, in Bioconductor. So over to you, uh, Christophe and Laurent. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter, for this kind of introduction. Um, I'll start by sharing my screen. <clears throat> so you should be able to see my screen. Um, <clears throat> so maybe just like, for, so thank you for, for this very kind introduction. Uh, so this, this workshop is, is given by myself and, and, and Laurent, who's also a, attending the, this meeting. Um, you can contact us through uh, Twitter or we are also available on, on GitHub. So any feedback is always, uh, uh, yeah, always nice. So don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Um, as Peter said, we are using the, um, the orchestra app to run our, our workshop. If you're willing to do this right now to follow along as possible, although I would, I mean, you're not obliged to do this. Uh, you'll be able to to follow the workshop just by by I'll, I'll I'll do the work let's say, but if you're interested and you want to learn more or do, or do more because there will there's a lot of material that I will not cover fully today, you can still access it through this orchestra app. So what you have to do is follow the link so app.orchestra.cancerdata.ty.org. You'll have a little login uh, panel. Either you can log in with Google or you can sign in uh, by mail. I mean both work well. Then you get the main orchestra uh, homepage. You go in the search bar, type SCP, because that's what mainly will be about today. Uh, you'll see probably a, there should be a single entry that is our workshop. Um, you can click on the title and then you will have access to the vignettes that I will go through today. Or you can click on the launch button uh, and then you will create, as Peter said, an R Studio instance. Um, so you simply have to, you'll see that there was this, this page, you wait a few minutes and then there was, there is a launch workshop button that will appear. You just have to uh, click on it and, 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 you're, and you're ready to work in R. So uh, I would like to thank Sean Davis, uh, Davis for, for putting this up. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great uh, app and a great way to kind of share our, our software and, and, and having this workshop work. Um, I'll move to the slide, uh, to the to the vignettes. Oops. Um, yeah. So, so this workshop is <coughs> was is first intended as a one and a half hour workshop. So don't don't worry if there are some parts I will just skip because I won't have time to to go uh, through it. Um, this workshop is, is split in two parts. First, we will I will give you an introduction about uh, Q features. Q features is a package for uh, manipulating and visualizing visualizing uh, uh, mass uh, yeah mass spectrometry based proteomics data. Let's say generally, and then I'll go to a, to the second part, which is more focused about uh, single cell proteomics application. So, using Q features, but uh, with a specific application for single cell proteomics, and I will show you how. Uh, I will show you this with all and with a practical example, an example where we reproduce an existing uh, workflow, but using our software. Um, so first, let's go to the Q features vignette. Um, so as I said, Q features is a package for the manipulation of mass spectrometry based quantitative proteomics data. So first of all, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Maybe some of you are, are, are familiar, but what is proteomics? Well, proteomics is the field that is studying the proteome of uh, biological samples. And a typical proteomics experiment starts, of course, with biological samples from which we extract the proteome. This proteome, so the proteins, are then digested into peptides. Those peptides are then um, yeah, run through the mass spectrometry. And this will yield uh, into uh, proteomics data. And what is the role proteomics data is called, uh, is usually called spectrum data. 
and because a spectrum is basically for each peptide you will get uh, the mass fingerprint so the, the mass uh, pattern for each peptide what is then happening is that with the the mass peptide the, the mass fingerprints we will do some uh well the, this uh, fingerprint contains the uh, information of the uh, type of peptide that you are you are having so you can do identification of the peptide retrieving so the peptide sequence and you can also have uh, quantitative information so basically quantifying the peptide when when you are able to map to identify a peptide we have a so-called um yeah peptide peptide to spectrum match uh, so you are able to match your spectrum to uh to the peptide sequence but actually well i mean it's proteomics it's not peptidomics so we are not interested especially interested into uh peptide to spectrum matches or psms we are more interested into proteomics so that's where q features uh, enters is we we will reconstruct the protein data from the psm data so yeah, so in the end, proteomics, well, what, what uh, this workshop will be about is reconstructing this. And so we'll be working with uh, quantitative data, quantitative data for features that are either PSMs, because you have different spectra, those can be um, uh, uh, peptides or they can be uh, proteins. And so, and then you have biological samples. So you have a matrix like quantitative data. So the, the most uh, evident class to use when you're using bioconductor is using the summarized experiment. So a summarized experiment, I mean, probably some of you already have experience with this, but it's divide. It's, it's it's a container that uh, kind of holds different type of information. The core information is the quantitative data. This is stored in the uh, in the assays slot. You can access it here. So and and this matrix has features as rows and samples as columns so for the you have associated to the column you can have some annotation and so for for each sample you can have extra uh, information such as I don't, know, I don't know the type of sample that you're having the, the batch that was acquired in the day of acquisition well you name it and this is access accessible through the call data uh, slot on the other hand you have features and for each feature you can also have annotation uh, for instance, the peptide sequence, if you're working with peptides. For protein, maybe the protein localization in the cell. Um, again, you name it. Uh, this is accessible using the raw data uh, slot. Okay. Uh, so that's summarized experiments. So where does Q features come in? Well, Q features will wrap up around uh, the summarized experiment. It's actually based on multi-assay experiments, if, if that rings a bell to anyone. So what we are doing, so suppose here, we, so we have, this is the typical workflow that we would uh, like to achieve using Q-features. So imagine on the left, this is a PSM data, so peptide spectrum matches. One box would, uh, one big column would represent typically a summarized experiment object. So, so here we have PSM data containing a summarized experiment. The idea is that Q-features will uh, do some different what we call aggregation that mean combining different features into uh, let's say if you're combining PSMs you will combine them into peptides if you are combining peptides you 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 will get uh, you want to do this for, to get proteins so let's take an example here we have uh, in this case so the, the second to fourth uh, feature corresponding to PSMs will be aggregated to a single peptide and here the, the orange peptide there are three different peptides because protein was split in in, 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 in in different chunks and those three peptides are aggregated to a single protein and in the end this final uh, block so this final data is a protein data that we are interested in to, to perform downstream analysis i mean there are different things you can do for, most typically it's doing different show abundance analysis for based on, on some treatment for instance Okay, so how does it work in practice? Well, any package you need to, to, to you start by loading it. So we load uh, Q features. Uh, Q features co comes along with many functions, but also some example data. And so in this case, we have one example data um, called feed one. So we call it 
And you can see feed one is an instance of class few features. That's why I'm talking about. And it contains one assay for the moment. And this assay, you can see it is called PSMs because it's peptide to spectrum matches that we are, that this example data is about. It's this, this assay. So within the Q features class is a summarized experiment object with 10 rows. And here a row is a PSM and two columns. So two uh, uh, bi biological samples, for instance. So we can extract, let's, let's see a bit what, what's, what's in there. Let, let's first look at the uh, sample annotation. So we, we retrieve the sample annotation using call data. And you can see here we have one variable. So here is one column. And this column is called group. This is group with, well, I mean, whatever you want. But here you, we have two samples, so we have two groups. You can imagine like treated this, uh, against non-treated uh, conditions, for instance. And so indeed we have uh, group one and so sample one is group one, sample two is group two. So um, with a few features object, we, we saw we have one assay called PSM, well, we can extract it. And this is done doing the, the double crack bracket subsetting. You can see when we apply this, so if we take, in this case, this means take the first assay in the Q features object, you get the a summarized experiment object with the 10 PSMs, the two uh, samples, and all the associated information. What you can also do is not say, okay, I don't want the first one. You can also like name, the, well, do a named subsetting. So we said the, 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 the assay is PSMs. Well, you can extract the PSMs assay from your Q features object. And this is exactly the same. So what's, yeah, most interesting is usually the quantitative data because that's why what you will that's what you will use um, for downstream analysis. So here we use assay. So <laughs> that's maybe a bit confusing, but there are several ways you can. So there is an assay in the Q features, which allows you to extract the summarized experiment. But when applying assay to a summarized experiment, then you get the data matrix, and this is what we're doing. So first we're extracting the first assay, the PSMs assay, and and with that summarized experiment, we extract the quantitative data. And you can see here, we have our 10 PSMs, our two samples and the different quantification. Of course, this is a mock example. I mean, <laughs> if, you, if you're seeing this in your data, there is, there is something wrong, but I mean, this is just for the purpose of illustration. So you can see the quantification go from one to 20. <clears throat> um, finally, as I said, we have sample annotation so we can retrieve the sample annotation using the row data. And here, so we have different PSMs and you can see we have information. For, so to what uh, peptide sequence this, uh, the spectrum was matched. So you can see we have several uh, uh, peptides that are this, uh, we have several peptides, but some are, are shared across PSMs. Similarly for protein. So this peptide to what protein is it uh, uh, mapped to that is through database search. Uh, and we can see we have two different proteins. You can have some specific uh, uh, variables to the PSM. So for instance, you can see this MOG variable saying, okay, we have, uh, I don't know, there, there's no particular meaning, but that you can see it's specific to each PSM. You can have the, the cell location that is, cross, that is specific to the protein, not the PSM this time, because you can see it's kind of shared across several PSMs. And then finally, you can have a p-value. Usually p-value corresponds to the identification probability of your PSM. And so you, th this one is again specific to each PSM. Okay, so that's, that's the uh, data container, like the Q-features data container, like in, in a nutshell, but what can you do with this? Um, so the, the, core, the core function of Q-features is this aggregation that I showed with the colored boxes. So I will here show a, a, an example of, of aggregation, what you would do. Um, so aggregation is performed using the aggregate feature function. Uh, it expects, of course, a Q features object. Here, I will use the feed one example data. But then it also uh, wants you to tell him, tell the function, uh, what assay should it aggregate? So in, the, in here, we will aggregate our only assay, PSMs. Then we need to say, okay, 
we, aggre we will aggregate the PSMs, I say, but how will we aggregate it? We will use the, the sequence uh, information available from the raw data. So let me just go back. Remember, we had here a, um, a variable called sequence. And so what, what the function will do, it will take all the PSMs belonging to the same uh, uh, sequence. So for instance, for this first peptide, it will take the PSM one, two, and three because they all share the same sequence information. Um, what we also need to say is, okay, by aggregating, we will, we will never like overwrite data. We would always create a new uh, assay. So the PSM's assay will just stay as it is. We will, in the queue features object, create a new similarized experiment. And um, this new similarized, this new assay needs to be uh, uh, named. And here in this case, because we, we want to aggregate to peptides, we'll ob obviously name it peptides. And the last argument that we need to supply is the function. How, how would it aggregate? What, how can it combine? Uh, oh yeah, no. How would it combine uh, the different quantitative value for, for, for several uh, uh, features? And in this case, it's simply taking uh, the core mean, basically taking the mean for, for each sample. So when running this, and if we look at the output, so before we had one assay called PSMs, now you can see a second assay appeared called peptides. It's a sum, again, a summarized experiment, but this time it contains only three rows. Remember, we here had only three peptides. So we can look, have a look at the raw data for this peptide assay. You can see Q features when aggregating will try to keep as much as the row, as the an feature annotation as possible. So it will take basically all the uh, um, annotations that are common for the aggregation group. So in this case, for the sequence was common to the aggregation group. Well, obviously. <laughs> then you have protein. Um, remember, we had two proteins, protein A and protein B. Well, for each peptide, you can you can have several. You could have well, maybe, maybe let's go back to the to the raw data. So for for this peptide, let's for the, for this. Uh, aggregation group, you can see we have common proteins. So this is always the same protein, so we can just keep it. Similarly, we have the same for the protein location. But you can see this is not the case for this variable, one, two, three, this is different in the aggregation group. Similarly for the p-value. And that's why if you look at the raw data of the aggregated assay, those, those variables disappeared. And finally, it added a, a new variable called dot n, which is simply the number, how many um, uh, features were in the aggregation group. So for instance, for this peptide, we had three PSMs. For uh, the second peptide, we had four. And for the last peptide, we had three again. So this is for, so I showed you how to aggregate uh, PSMs to peptides. But we obviously can do the same from peptides to proteins. So I just showed you this. This is exactly the same thing. The, the, the things that change is that this time we are aggregating peptides we are aggregating based on the protein name and we will call the new assay proteins and this time instead of using core means we call using core medians that's an example of course and you can see then when printing this object we have a new uh, assay called proteins this time with two proteins remember protein a protein b we can have a look a quick look at the quantitative data of the proteins assay and you can see that uh, indeed we have uh, two, two features and two samples. So two proteins and two samples. Um, so this is a very simplistic example of, of aggregation, but you can do much more than aggregation. You can have more, more, more steps that, that I will just show later. Um, the thing is, as I said, we are always adding data. And so sometimes you might kind of lose track of what, what is happening. And, if, if the number of assay gets big, it it's, might be hard to get an overview of what you are doing. So there is a plot function of a Q, for a Q features object that will give you a, a summary of, of or like an overview of your object. And so in this case, the overview is, so we started with a PSM assay represented by this little circle that is then aggregated and the aggregation direction is given by the arrow to a peptides assay that is then aggregated to the proteins assay. 
So in this case, it's, it's rather easy to follow, but sometimes you might have much bigger uh, data sets or much bigger, uh, a much longer workflow. And, and so this allows you to, to quickly see what you are doing. And it also helps you if you need at the end to report. Uh, <laughs> it, it basically gives a quick um, yeah, workflow overview of what you actually did. So next, an important step, so this was aggregations, this is the core feature, but an important steps are also subsetting. And so in this case, um, subsetting can happen in three directions. And so there is a free index subsetting that is available for few features. So first, so, so using this uh, brackets function, you can have three indices. The first index will uh, subset for the feature. So you can have a feature name. Here I show an example. Imagine your feature name is uh, a peptide. So you will select this peptide. Not, on, not only will it detect that your peptide is in that assay, it will also detect uh, because when aggregating, we keep track of what feature where was aggregated from what. And so subset, subsetting for this feature will also take the associated uh, PSMs. In this case, those, those three PSMs. So that's for feature uh, subsetting. Then you can also subset for samples. So giving, give the sample name and it will automatically detect that in the different assays, the sample is present and it will only collect those, um, those, those data. And finally, if you apply it, uh, if you use the last um, index, you can subset for an assay. So simply if you're only interested into proteins, well, you can basically get rid of all the other assays and keep only the last the last one. Um, here I show an example. Um, so remember we had a uh, feed one is has 10 PSMs, it has three peptides and it has two proteins, but now protein A and B. And so now if we say, okay, I, I just want to have the, the data for protein A, well, here we have this three index subsetting. We just supply the uh, first index, so protein A. It will detect that there is one protein called like that. That is that it is linked to two peptides and those two peptides are linked to six PSMs. And here we have a subset of our data containing only information for protein A. Um, so that's, that's one way of subsetting. Another interesting way to subset is to subset based on available annotation. Um, and so for instance, uh, and, and this, is can, this can be performed using filter features. Filter features expects uh, a Q feature object and it expects uh, um, an, um, a formula, like uh, a condition. And in this case, we'll see, okay, we only keep the PSMs that have identification probability, so a p-value below 5%. And in this case, you can see we have four PSMs that are, that, that, are, that have a p-value below 5%. But since this variable is not available in the peptides and the proteins assay, well, none of those features are selected. So if you're interested to do this, better do this before aggregating than after aggregating. You can, another, another example is saying, okay, we are interested only in proteins that are located to the mitochondrion. There was one protein doing so, and then well, we, again, subset all the available, uh, so, so all the associated peptides and PSMs. Um, yeah, and this is doing the, you're not obliged to do what is uh, true. You can also do what is false, and well, that's a simple uh, syntax. Um, yeah, also something that is quite interesting when dealing with uh, um, uh, proteomics data is that there is a lot of missing. You that they, there might be a lot of missing data, so handling this missing data is, is important. So for, we have here an example um, of uh, a Q features object containing one uh, assay. We just call it NA because it contains uh, missing data. And you can see indeed we have three missing data. Well, we can filter for uh, features that, that, that have less missing data than let's say uh, uh, 25%. And if we're doing this, uh, so if we say, okay, we keep only features that have uh, less than 25% missingness. Well, I mean, in this case, it's a bit, it's a bit, uh, let's say, uh, it, it, it's really mock, it's a mock example. Um, 
but but basically when doing this you will remove all features that have uh, uh, one at least one uh, uh, missing value and so you can see if we do filter na we apply we give it we provided the queue features object we apply this filter na to the na uh, uh, assay and we say okay we want a threshold of 25 percent missingness well in the end you'll you'll keep only one uh, one psm which is basically this one because it has no missing data but of course in, in more complicated settings with much more samples and much more features this can be very interesting because this will allow you to filter like uh, features that are below some, some percentage so then we can do uh, some data processing and here I will give you three examples um, one very typical thing to do when dealing with proteomics data is to log transform um, I mean this is also done in uh, often done in, 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 in uh, RNA-seq uh, for instance uh, so log transform it takes a Q features object um, it, it also re requires you to uh, supply which assay do you want to look transform uh, so in this case uh, it's uh, we can do it on on the proteins data we use a, a, a log2 uh, transformation so base2 and we call it this new assay because we're not overriding data we call it log proteins and so indeed if we if you run this this function in the end you get a new assay called log proteins it contains it has the same dimensions as the proteins but the data the quantitative data is log transformed something very similar is normalization so you can use normalize again let's normalize the proteins um, we can there are different methods that are available and here as an example we can just center the median and we again because we're not overriding data we call the new assay norm protein and indeed just like log proteins we have norm proteins and they have the same dimensions as, as proteins, as the protein assay. Finally, we have imputation using the imputes function. So remember, we had that few features um, uh, with, with missing data. Well, if we use impute, and this, uh, this time using, let's say, zero imputation, well, if we look at the quantitative data after imputation, we can see that all the NAs became zero. And so that's that's Q features. That's how Q features work in a nutshell. If you're interested to get more, let's say, detailed information and and uh, information about all the available functions, well, I suggest you to go to the to the Q features vignette. Um, we we made I think an, an extensive vignette, and if things are not clear, ne never hesitate to to raise an issue. Um, but that's so here I just explained to you what what uh, how to how to manipulate proteomics data. Uh, using Q features. Um, I may uh, do a little break, uh, I mean, for, for questions. Um, yeah, Peter, I don't know if in the Slack there are... Uh, well, I had a question myself, so I might oh, okay. take the chance to ask that. So are functions like uh, the filter features function applicable or like uh, generalizable to arbitrary summarized experiment based objects? Um, like that kind of, uh, yeah, basically that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that, that, that's a good question. I mean, <laughs> um, now by heart, I don't I don't remember. Maybe Laurent, you remember? Um, yes, I, I would say so. Um, so that Q features object contains summarized experiments or single cell experiments. And there is no other knowledge, uh, you know, incorporated in that object that says it's proteomics. It can, you can use it. And the Q features are actually, uh, a derived class from the multi-assay experiment. So yeah, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't really care what's inside as long as the, the names match. Yeah, okay, because that, that's really good because I guess I asked because I've tried, I've designed uh, derivatives of summarized experiments for DNA methylation data. And one of the challenges for it is how much of the functionality should be specific to the subclass versus like a general grammar, which for me is way too ambitious and like uh you know i think um like stuart lee who's done the ply rangers package has done work towards that but um and i think uh stefano who we heard from an earlier in biosy asia who's developed the tidy summarized experiment they've tried to design sort of more general grammars and how do you approach it then uh, with with uh q features i guess in uh in terms of proteomic specific stuff versus um 
general bioconductor rectangular data. Um, I suppose, for example, aggregation, although it works on any type of summarized or any summarized experiment, whatever it contains, but the aggregation is something that is typical to proteomics. But the data mm -hmm. containers are general. Yep. Uh, well, I guess filtering an ACE, you know, in se se RNA sequencing, you don't really have missing values in single cell, you would have zeros. So again, filter yeah. RNA could work on any assay, but typically it's used for proteomics. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, there's no other questions in the, in the Slack at the moment. If anyone has a question, they can raise their hand and we can pop them on video. Otherwise, um, if you want to, uh, I assume you took a break because you have a. Uh, the, you want to move on to the second part? Is that is that right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I just be, before starting going to so now we'll go to to the single cell application. But I, I was I just wanted to make sure that for the moment, like the general, let's say more uh, general proteomics uh, uh, application is is clear. I mean. Uh, yep. Uh, like thank this, you. I guess I hope that everything's so okay. So so now I'll move on to to single cell proteomics. Um, so something you have to know is that okay generally bulk proteomics uh, is, is working on, on uh, i would say large samples but of course that's relative uh, but usually thousands or, or hundreds of thousands of uh, cell equivalents here we are moving to single cell proteomics so meaning that one sample is one cell and the the uh, uh, sample amounts are of course much smaller so so, so single cell proteomics is a very new field because uh, it has emerged thanks to, to very recent uh, technological advances. And the, most of the advances include uh, reducing the sample loss, uh, increasing the sensitivity and the quantification accuracy, accuracy of course, and, and increasing the throughput because if you have a single, you cannot do much with, with a single cell, you, have, you need hundreds or thousands of, of single cells. Um, so, here in this in this work, well, there are, there are many different technological advances that, that that came out. I mean, there are two main trends. Uh, either well, that's more uh, proteomic specific uh, for for what's more expertise. But uh, there is uh, label free quantification, or there's label based. So that those are the two main trends for the moment. Um, but here I will only focus on, on on one specific method called the scope two, which is uh, uh, a methodology. Uh, it's 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 a uh, yeah, it's a it's a, it's a method to acquire single cell proteomics data, and they also, and along with the scope two, they also provided a, a workflow, and that that's uh, I will here show. Uh, well, I mean, the content of this workshop is is able to be produced. So how is what what does scope do do? So here I'll go back a bit more conceptually to and going back also to what uh, proteomics is, but. Here we have first, the first step is sample preparation. So um, samples here, as I said, single cells. Um, um, and from those single cells, they need to be isolated. They need to be lysed and the proteins to be extracted. Of course, if you want to measure proteins, you need to extract the proteins. Those proteins are then digested into peptides and peptides are then labeled. Uh, this labeling allows to, to pull different uh, cells in, in, in one single acquisition. And so at the moment, we, we are able to, to pull up to 16 samples at once. So we have then a, a pool of labeled peptides that are then sent to liquid chromatography. So basically, you, you send it to, to, a, to an instrument where, where the peptides will be separated depending on the mass and on the affinity for, for the chromatographic column. This allows a separation and, and reduce complexity of a sample. Those um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, peptides are then ionized. Um, this is required for, for doing afterwards the mass spectrometry, so MS. Um, this often happen in, well, I mean, it, this happened in tandem or even in three rounds. But here I will show you the example for in two rounds. So you have your peptides. There will be the mass of the peptides will be measured. So you will have um, here a pattern for each time point coming out of the column, you will have different peptides. And, and here each peak corresponds to a peptide. So you have the, the mass of your peptide, but you want to also be able to identify it. So you need to fragment this peptide. And this is done through a second mass spectrometry uh, run. Well, yeah, run. 
And in this case, th this is the pattern for a single peptide that was fragmented. And you can see you have different uh, mass fragments, so, so bits of the, of the peptide that, that produces this mass. And out of these bits, you also have important information about the labeling. This will, this will be useful for the quantification. So, th so this information, this mass spectrometry, this, this is what we call the spectrum. This is stored in a, in a raw file that will then be analyzed using uh, identification and quantification software. So the quantification is taking this region of the spectrum and it will transform uh, labels into uh, uh, sample uh, quantities. Then you also have uh, the rest of the spectrum that can be used and matched to a, to a ferret called database to retrieve the peptide sequence. Doing so, we are able to retrieve the quantification table and that's the PSM table I, I've been talking about. So, so up to now, this is very uh, general. I mean, this is also the workflow that you would use, I mean, the methodological workflow that you would use uh, for acquiring uh, proteomic data, but each of these steps were refined so that you are able to measure single cell uh, data. Then, so that's the scope two uh, method. Along, along with the uh, methodological method, they also provide a computational method, so different steps um, on, on how to process the data. Uh, the thing is that they, they uh, offered this, this, this workflow as like built from, from, from scratch using uh, base uh, data tables and, and this script was, was actually hard to, to read. So um, what we did is we, uh, we uh, formalize and standardize this protocol using bioconductor and, and, and standardized uh, uh, data classes uh, to reproduce this data. And this, this is basically the, the, what the rest of this uh, workshop will be about. So um, first, so I talked about the QFeatures uh, framework. Well, we adapted it a little bit um, to account for single cell data, so single cell proteomics data. And what I mean by this, so there is one thing first, um, you can on, only acquire up to 16 samples per, uh, per run. Uh, but with single cells, you're interested by way more than 16 samples. So what you do is usually you acquire different runs. And so each run is considered as a separate assay in our few features object. So you can see here, instead of having one PSM um, object, uh, assay, sorry, we have several PSM ob object uh, assays. So here in this case, in this little example, we have three assays, but it can go to much more like 200, for instance. Um, those PSM data are then just like general proteomics uh, uh, aggregated to peptides and proteins. This uh, principle is the same, but here another difference is that each assay is no more summarized experiment. It's a single cell experiment. And this is simply because single cell experiments offer an interface to many uh, very useful functions for for uh, handling single cell uh, data and for downstream analysis. One 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 typical thing you, you can think about is uh, dimension reduction. Um, so that's that's our general framework. This is how we want to see single cell proteomics data. And now what we also did is we implemented this framework. Uh, we made a little extension to uh, Q features called the SCP package. So SCP really builds upon Q features and adds a few additional uh, functions. The most interesting one is probably the read SCP that facilitates uh, import of, of SCP data. But then you can have uh, other different uh, functions for doing some uh, quality control that are specific to, to uh, Q features or, or for handling the fact that we have different, um, that we have multiple assays uh, um, for, for, for some data level. So for instance, for PSM data, we have multiple uh, assays and this might require to facilitate the workflow, require uh, more dedicated functions. So I'll spend a little bit of time on how to load SCP data since this is, uh, and yeah, how to read SCP data because this is the core function of the, of the package. And I mean, <laughs> that's sometimes the, uh, it can be a, a struggle to do this. So, um, so here you, I want to stress out, you have two types of information when you start a, a, a single cell uh, proteomics uh, analysis. So first you have what I call the feature data and you have the sample data. Sample data, this is basically your experimental design that you define yourself. 
the feature data is what's come out of the identification and quantification uh, software that you are using to uh, process your spectral data. So feature data here, so oh yeah, of course, what we do again is we load the library SCP. L SCP partly depends on QFeat, so doing this you also load uh, QFeaties. Um, we have uh, also example data sets in the SCP package, and this time it's, it's called MQ SCP data. MQ is because it's the data was generated using uh, was identified and quantified using MaxQuant, which is the software. Um, and you can see here it's 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 a small data set with uh, uh, over 1000 PSMs in uh, 150 samples. Um, so this this uh, feature data, first of all, contains quantitative data. And here, well, this is because of how MaxQuant works. It, it stores the quantitative data in in the channel called uh, in the column called reported intensity dot and then followed by a number. So. For the moment, what we what we have is simply a data frame or, or data matrix, what, what you prefer. Um, so you can see in this example, our we have 16 quantification columns because um, in the experiment, 16 labels for multiplexing were used. Then you can look at those columns. Uh, so I just stored those column names in, in a variable and then just uh, Call it called the data frame and subset for, for those columns, and you can see this is this is how the, the quantification looks like. Th this is signal intensity. The other important information you can find in the feature data is the uh, feature annotation. So not quantification, but annotation. And so here you have different things. Uh, we can <laughs> remember in the Q features uh, vignette on the first part we had sequence. Well, this we have again. With our, with our peptide sequences, the length of the peptide, retention time. Retention time is the retention time on the chromatographic column. So when doing the separation, we also have the mapped uh, proteins, uh, for instance. So this is the sample, the feed, sorry, that is the feature annotation that is linked to it. A last in, uh, interesting uh, information is the uh, file from which the PSM was found. So basically from which experiment, from which run was it found. And in this case, if we look at the, the files from, from this table, we can see we have four unique entries, meaning that the data that we are looking at was acquired in four different runs, four different experiments. So, so that's the feature data. So we have quantitative data, feature annotation, and the file information. Then we have the sample annotation. So that's the uh, experimental design that, that you are, well, that, that the experimenter is, is creating. Um, here again, we have an example called sample annotation. That's again, just simply a data frame. Um, we have uh, one, one column that is the raw dot file. So, so for, for each sample, we have information and, and an important information is from which file do, do you find the sample? The other important information is from which quantification, wh to which quantification does it belong to? And then you can have all sorts of other information. So sample type, uh, the liquid, so LC is liquid chromatography batch, the, on which day it was sorted, uh, the type of digestion, for instance. And again, you, you name it, you can add anything, any data that you have. So that's the two pieces that we need. We have feature data, sample annotation. What we are now ready to, to supply it to uh, read SCP. And how does read SCP work? Well, we have, uh, again, this feature data sample annotation. Well, we have three types of data, the feature uh, annotation, feature metadata, the quantification columns, and the MS batch, or the, the uh, file information. And on the sample uh, annotation, similarly, we have the quantification column names. Um, so this one. We have the uh, MS batch, which is the same as here, and we have the sample metadata. And what read SCP will do, it will connect, it will link the, the, the different pieces. So it, based on MS batch, you can see it's the same color. It will recognize that it's coming from, from this, this information is linked. And then from the quantification columns, it will see, okay, here I have different quantification columns corresponding to the names of the columns here. And when you apply this to read SCP, what it will do, it will automatically split the data according to the different 
batches to the different files. It will separate the quantitative data that you can retrieve with assays. Remember, uh, um, from the few features uh, vignette, you can retrieve the quantitative data using assays. You can have the sample annotation using raw data. And then the sample annotation is transformed to a call data that is within the queue features uh, object automatically linked uh, to the corresponding samples. And also the last thing it will do is each of the assays will be converted to a single cell experiment. So that's what read SCP does. So now in practice, so we have the read SCP function. So it expects two, uh, two the two input tables, so the, the feature data table and the uh, sample annotation table. The other thing it needs, well, I mean, it says it will <laughs> connect the pieces. It needs a little bit of indications. So to connect the pieces, it needs it needs him to tell, okay, in a watch column, can you find the uh, uh, run uh, information, the file information? So this information in both tables what was contained in, in raw.file. And then it will also need to say, okay, in the sample annotation, which column links to the quantification columns? And this was this column was channel. Let's, let's, let's go up a bit. So you can see in the channel, it contains the information report the intensity of the one, which was one of the one of the quantification columns in the feature table. Okay, and so when doing this, it 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 uh, explains what what it exactly does, or well, what it does, and then in the end we can have uh, an overview of our uh, newly read uh, data. So here I call it SCP. And so you can see that this this object is a, an object of class Q features, exactly what I showed in the previous uh, in the previous in the first part. It has four assays. Uh, this is because there were four the data was acquired in four different files, four different experiments. The name of the assay is the name of this file, the, is the file name or the experiment name. And then you can see that each of the assays is a single cell experiment object with uh, different numbers of Features. So in this case, it's a peptide spectrum match and 16 columns because there were 16 um, um, samples, 16 uh, labels that were used in, in these experiments. Um, we can retrieve the call data and this is basically we, we get the, uh, the sample annotation table that we got at, at the beginning, but this time it's link, linked to each quantification column and to each, and to each assay in the in the queue features object. And so the, again, you can see we have the sample type, LC batch, sort day, type of digestion. We also have the uh, sample uh, annotation, uh, feature, sorry, the feature annotation that was retrieved. Remember from, from the first part, we can do this uh, using the raw data. We, we look at the raw data for, the, uh, for, for, for this assay. And you can see we retrieve this, this information. So, for instance, we have sequence the, the peptide sequence, uh, the peptide length, and, and and so on. And finally, and probably most interesting, is the the quantification data. So using so using the assay function, we can retrieve uh, the quantitative uh, data for a specific uh, assay. Okay, so so that's it. So that's how you read um, SCP data. Uh, and you convert it to a queue feature subject ready for, or using the workflow I showed in, in, in part one. But at this point, you might feel maybe a little bit uh, frustrated because uh, you might say, yeah, well, I don't have single cell proteomics data. So basically I can't do anything. Well, <laughs> no problem because we did, we implemented also the SCP data package for exactly so, so for demonstration purpose for uh, just getting your hands on it, or even if you're interested to develop new feed, new new methodologies, well, it, this can serve as a as a as a work as a, as a base ground for, for for building new new methods. So what you can do is simply load, oui, no, <laughs> yeah, you can simply load the uh, SCP data package. If you run SCP data, the function, it will give you an overview of all the available uh, data sets. So for, for the moment, we are about 13 or 14, we have 13 or 14 different data sets. Um, so they're, they're, uh, usually they, they are named after the first author, then the year of publication. Um, yeah, and then, and then you can find some, some additional information. And so for instance, the, the, the scope, uh, scope two methodology, 
um, they also provided all the data that, that they acquired and this was this is work by uh, Harrison Speck and and his colleagues uh, and so and so the name of the data set is Speck 2019 here you cannot see it but it's version version 3 because they had different versions of of the data and the li latest version 3 is the most uh, is a yeah we have most data here i show just an example so suppose you're interested in uh, the data set that was published by uh, zoo et al in 2019 in, in eLife um, you can just call the function and it will give you a uh, an instance of class q features containing 62 assays um, you can see here th these are different runs and then the two last one is the peptides so they also provide the peptide data and they also provided the protein space maybe here let me just um I'll, I'll just show you how this works in practice um very quickly so i have library svp data um so if i do i don't know data set so here it will okay it will start it will look for for the the zueta data set and in this in this case i just tested this morning so it's already uh, downloaded but since it's downloaded it goes to cache and then it, it simply loads it from cache and so now i can have a look at data sets so it, it, that's the exactly same output i just showed you uh, you can see we have 16 62 assays so at this point you remember i said it can it can become quite confusing um, when you have many assays how to work so if i do so i can what i can do is simply plot the the data set and you can see i hope you, well maybe it's a bit oh yeah sorry it's maybe a little bit small, small let me just increase the the size of the uh, appearance okay sorry i don't know if it was maybe hard to read but here you have library sp data uh, i i i, I for the moment, I just did what was on the on the vignette, uh, and so here I plotted the data set, and you can see here on the right, it's, it's a little bit, little bit small, sorry for that, but there is an overview of what the data set is, and so you can see there are actually uh, 60 runs, uh, all PSMs, that are then that were then aggregated, I mean, uh, using different methods, but here it's only the, the data that was provided by the authors, so you can have the one, all those, um, PSM's data are linked to one peptide assay, and then to uh, that peptide assay is linked to the protein assay. Um, you can see here I have a little warning saying, "Okay, I have many, I have many assays. This may be not the, the best way to to look at it." So we also provide an interactive uh, plot. That's if you want to to better explore. Um, and so so here it's basically the same plot, but here now you can. It's using plotly you can start to zoom in and uh, see okay okay i have this uh i can zoom out uh, i can zoom out i can i can move in the string I, I can move in the plot uh and then look at specific okay saying okay this one in this case is quite it's quite easy but again sometimes you can have more complicated workflows um where where things are, are maybe a little bit more messy and then and then you can kind of explore the data like this Okay, this is this is just like a small parenthesis I wanted to show you, um, and you can do this for all the data sets present in SCP data. Um, so here, uh, here I will go very, uh, I'll be very brief, brief about that. Maybe just give you, giving you the the hints on how to uh, run this because I won't go myself into the details. But here we reproduced a, a published data set, so the Scope Two data set, as I said, that was um, published by uh, Spec and and colleague in. Well, the publication is from 2021, but the data was already available in 2019. And here, the, here is a formalization of their workflow. So all the, those different steps. So you can see different th those different steps have different colors. So we colored the boxes in orange. Um, those are those are the steps that are implemented by in SCP. The blue boxes are, are um, func functions or, or steps that that are already available from Q features. And then there is one gray box that is a custom, um, a custom function um, 
So you can see that for the moment, uh, most of the steps are, are basically, well, general proteomics, let's say bug proteomics uh, functionality, but maybe that in the future, but when doing more development and better understanding the data, well, maybe those bugs will start to turn out in, in orange. <laughs> we'll see, the future will tell us. Um, uh, so here, what we do is we import the data. So as I said, this is the spec 2019 version three data. We, we store it as a scope two. And for, for, this, um, for this little uh, workshop, if you want to run it yourself, to avoid too much computational burden and, and, and to focus more on, on what, what things are actually done. We just subset on, on one uh, batch uh, called the LC for liquid chromatography batch three. Um, uh, that contains a little bit less, well, we, we're reducing the amount of, of data. And then basically you can go through the different steps. So you can see uh, on the right, there is the uh, table of content. Well, those are the different steps. Uh, maybe let me just show you uh, one. Actually, I have just time for, for one step. Um, I want to show you here, not going too much into details, but well, typically it is something that can be interesting. And I think is super important is doing quality control, filtering for the for high quality uh, features. So what you do usually when you do quality control is first you compute the metric and then you filter on the metric. And so this is basically what is happening here. So we have our, our data set, RCB3. And we what this step does, it's converting the posterior error probabilities to uh, false discovery rate, to, to Q values. I mean, the, the exact details, if you're interested in, into this, uh, are explained in the vignette. But I mean, just let's say we want to, to, to compute some, some Q values. So we have our, our Q features object. We say from which assays do we want to uh, compute this metric. Here it's all. Um, so this metric requires an input from the raw data, from the sample annotation. That's called Darth PEP, whatever that means. And it will create a new metric that it will store back again in the raw data. And this, this, this is called the Q value. So because we're computing Q values at the PSM level. And so running this, well, similarly, nothing will happen, but actually uh, a new variable called Q value PSM is, is added to the raw data, to the sample annotation of, of our data sets. Um, here, the, the second step is basically the same thing, except that we group by protein so that we can get FDR or Q values at a protein level. So that's that's how we compute metrics. That's, that's just an example. I mean, you could... Um, there are other metrics available, or you can even like think about your own metric, implement it, and, and maybe, yeah, if you're interested by this, if you think you have a good metric, you can send an issue and, and we can implement it in a, in a wrapper function. But once you have those metrics available from the raw data, what you can do is you can use the filter features on our Q features object and then applying, okay, we want a FDR below 1% at the PSM and a, and a FDR below 1% at the protein level. And, and go on and, and, and so forth. And you can do this for, for different uh, uh, functions uh, that are available. I suggest you can, if, if you're interested by this, you can just go through the vignette. I think it's, it should be well explained. And, uh, and yeah, I hope um, this was interesting to you. If you have any questions, uh, I'm open to it. I mean, I see it's nine o'clock, so <laughs> maybe it's right on time. I don't know if we have time for questions. <laughs> Yeah, we are right on top. Thank you, Christoph. That was that was wonderful. Um, I think people who do have questions, if they uh, ask on the Slack, and um, we'll make sure that if any questions there, we we tag you on so that you you get a notification on those. Um, uh, a big thank you to you both uh, for joining us this morning, and uh, it's really lovely to hear about the work you've been doing. Uh, and um, for people that are interested in this, uh, Christoph just published. Uh, Christoph and Loren just published a an article in uh, Frontiers. Sorry, I've forgotten which journal it was. I, was, I just tweeted it out, so you, you can you can find it online uh, following the BioC Asia hash, hashtag. Um, and Christoph just tweeted out a, a few days ago. So uh, reviewing sort of state of the art for single cell proteomics uh, analysis. Um, there's been a slight change. Um, if you look on the Slack, you'll see that we have been asked to move to the Japanese workshop channel. So the link's been posted there in the Slack uh, 
to just join Kozo to uh, hear his uh, final uh, wrap up on today, on today and, on, and on the week. Um, so thank you, Christoph, and thank you, Lorraine, um, for joining us today. And I hope you have a, a good rest of your day and, and week ahead. Mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you very much. Thanks bye bye. For